Um, now, um, now, now the advances I'm going to talk about are in many areas. So I'm going to focus on two areas that are featured prominently in this conference. And, um, and these two areas are um, research with low latency data, which I'll define shortly, and then climate risk research. I'll also mention that these are the two areas of focus for radar right now and, and the way we're expanding on our data, um, uh, on the uh, data availability on the, on the uh, radar data warehouse. Now, until recently, data collections in radar and at places like Ed Pinto's American Enterprise Institute, Karen Cowles Urban Institute, and Bob Avery's uh, FHFA have focused on amassing and merging available databases in the market. Okay, so Bob Avery is going to discuss one such application of this, which is the National Mortgage Database. Um, and in radar today, I actually asked him to do some counts of this. We have 260 terabytes of consumer finance and property data, and that's just on the basic data, and, and over 125 billion observations going back into the 1990s. Okay, um, now when the pandemic hit, we learned that one drawback of these databases is that they come to us with a considerable lag, lasting anywhere from, uh, from 45 days to six months. So an extreme example, um, is that the FHFA house price indices, the data are not obtained until after origination, which means the data really comes from the previous quarter. So the data, by the time you view the data, it actually can be as much as six months old. So what is low latency data? And it's, it's actually commonly referred to as real-time data, but Bob Hunt reminded me that this would totally confuse the macro economist at the Philadelphia Fed who actually use the term entirely differently. But low latency data are gener data generally produced closest to the data source, which gives you the ability to get data in a very timely way. So to maximize the effectiveness of low latency data, we're partnering with data providers closest to where the data are first collected, such as credit card and mortgage service bureaus that collect and process transaction and performance for borrowers. So one question is, why now? Um, the and, and, uh, and there's at least three reasons. The first is that computing uh, um, power has continues to advance. So we have a massively parallel processing environment that now can process billions of observations of data in just a few minutes or even a few seconds. This was obviously unthinkable years ago. So getting transaction level data um, is, you know, not a real challenge. And, and many of the people here are actually going to talk about that today. Now, compute storage has gotten much cheaper. In fact, I saw a study that said a, a, a gigabyte of data cost $300,000 to store in 1981 but it's gone down to about 10 cents by 2012. So I did a little calculation on this. So in 1981, data storage for the 260 terabytes of radar data warehouse would have cost $78 billion <laughs> to be able to store, which is a little bit less than I think the amount that we actually return to the treasury right now. <laughs> um, right now that storage, by 2012, that storage costs about $25,000. So that's a huge advance. In fact, multiple listing service providers now are actually adding pictures to their data. So which obviously would have been unthinkable just a few years ago. Now, most importantly of all, cloud computing has made data access almost instantaneous. So if you can get these service bureaus to actually load data right onto a cloud environment and make it accessible, then you can get that data in virtual real time. And that's actually exactly what's happened. And several people, there's several people are, we're actually gonna talk about it. I'm gonna bring up three examples here that are gonna be featured prominently in this, uh, 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 in this session. Um, and it also includes some research from people that are here right now. So for example, mortgage origination data from Optimal Blue um, is generated daily and used in several research papers and in, and in, um, and in some reports that Ed Pinto is going to discuss today. Uh, multiple listing service data is being used by economists to develop real-time home price indices. Remember what I said about how we have it with a six-month lag. 
With multiple listing service data, you can actually can get it in real time since they get the data daily. You know, they, they, uh, they actually use a house price information. Now, Ed Pinto's come up with an especially clever way to use the data because he's actually looking, uh, using the optimal blue data, which is actually mortgage application data, which actually gives you a forward looking view of what house prices are. And I'll let Ed talk about that some more. Now, finally, uh, here in Radar, we recently acquired the McDash flash data um, drawn from, uh, from Black Knight's mortgage servicing platform, which is a service bureau that processes mortgage payments on around 70% of the mortgages in the market. Now, they, produce a, they produced a daily download of their data and put it out on their cloud, um, sending us updates a couple of days after they loaded it. Now, to give you an example, um, we produced the following chart on delinquencies and foreclosure starts as of April 30th. This table was produced on May 3rd, and we had it available. So we were able to get the information on foreclosure starts, which, of course, showed a pattern of that, you know, after the pandemic ended and the foreclosure moratorium stopped, we didn't see this huge surge in foreclosures and all. And you're seeing how the uh, delinquencies are actually coming down relative to where they were even pre-pandemic. So, like I said, we obtained that information on May 3rd. It normally we wouldn't have received that information until about mid to late June. OK, so that's the first big advance. Now I'm going to go in the. Um, in exactly the opposite direction here and um, and discuss climate risk property data and research. Now, with these data, one application is to develop forward looking scenarios for climate risk that can look out decades into the future, even into the next century, even after the time that Bob Avery retires from the FHFA. <laughs> So we're expanding space and time here, here. But what's special about the climate risk research is its interdisciplinary nature. And I was talking to Nancy Wallace about this. So, um, you, you know, so if you look at the bottom in our uh, stress test, economists at the Fed estimate bank loss models. So that's down at the bottom. Um, but to estimate climate risk hazard or property damage models, we need expertise from disciplines that are far outside economics. So what I did was I listed down the left-hand side all of the different experts that go into producing these different types of loss estimates. So like, what do we do here at the Fed? Well, we can't produce our own models, so we're actually buying model outputs, potentially even models themselves. In fact, we've loaded the very first estimates of flood risk from a company, and that's, a, and that's actually available out on the Radar Data Warehouse, and I thank Sean and his team for doing all the work on that, and of course the Kansas City Fed for loading the data. Now, and, and I mentioned here, um, you know, that that's a special thing. Now, so as for climate risk research, just read this sentence here. It says here, our empirical estimate to the incidence of California wildfires indicate the key meteorological features such as the uh, direction and speed of the wind, the humidity levels and maximum temperatures are important as they are the, as are the slope of the site, its elevation and the density of the density of vegetative coverage. Now you would think that this would come from like an earth science paper or something like that. It's actually done by some economists in the business school at Berkeley one co-author of which is Nancy Wallace, who's here at the conference and is going to be and, and is actually going to be uh, going to be uh, discussing a paper. Okay, well, well, that's the end of my remarks. I mean, there's a lot going on here, um, but I'm going to close with a story about a book I recently read. That that what we're doing in economics is actually very similar to what's going on in the physical sciences. So, a fascinating recent book is Walter Isaacson's book that I would, uh, that, that um, um, about that, uh, that centered on the life of Jennifer Doudna, another Berkeley, uh, a, a, another Berkeley professor who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020. Now she started up the Innovative Gen uh, Genomics Institute, which is a large consortium of academic and corporate scientists that work together to come up with ways to test um, to test for COVID-19 and ultimately help come up with cures for the coronavirus. What's fascinating about the book, it was written in real time during the COVID. So Walter Isaacson was actually following her, um, 
following her work. And this is what she, this is what she wrote in The Economist here about it to talk about the interdisciplinary work going on. So this is going on not just in the social sciences, but also in the physical sciences. So welcome everybody here. We're going to have a great conference. And I really look forward to hearing everybody. Thanks a lot. I'm pleased to open the first day of our conference with a panel discussion on uh, the mortgage market in the wake of COVID-19. What have we learned and what lies ahead? Uh, we're privileged to have four experts with us today on the panel with backgrounds in industry, academia, and policy institutes. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to refer you to the, um, to the uh, biographies which have been uh, posted online. Each of the panelists is going to uh, deliver a short prepared remarks. And then uh, afterwards, they've asked for a few minutes to challenge each other. Uh, after that, uh, we're going to open it up to questions and comments from the audience. I'll be monitoring the chat. Uh, so those who are participating virtually should feel free to submit their questions there. If uh, you're online and you'd also like to pose your question yourself, after writing it in the chat, please raise your hand uh, and uh, we'll, we'll unmute you. Um, so our first panelist will be Michael Frantino from the Mortgage Bankers Association. All right, thank you, Ernell, and good to see everybody. Um, I'm gonna kick things off just really giving from an industry standpoint, state of the market and along three dimensions. First, what we're seeing in terms of the origination market. Second, looking at lender costs and some of the techno technological transformations that have been undergoing uh, during the pandemic. And then finally, uh, some servicing data, particularly with respect to forbearance, given that was really the innovation uh, during the pandemic. So first, with respect to origination, this is our estimate of historical origination volume and, and our forecast. So what to take away from here? Well, we're coming off of two of the largest origination years ever in the neighborhood of $4 trillion. And, and our forecast is it's going to drop about 35% to about 2.6 trillion in 2022. See the different colored bars here. That's uh, the other transformation going from a predominantly refinance market to a predominantly purchase market. What does that mean if you're a lender? It is a wildly different business, right? With the refinance market, it is your customers calling you asking for a refinance. With the purchase market, it's going out on the street, working with realtors, builders, others, trying to get customers to work with you as a lender. It's a very different, more expensive proposition. Um, on top of that, we're obviously having an enormous amount of policy uncertainty. Mortgage rates are up more than two percentage points over the last year with much of that increase occurring in 2022. And we're also conducting an experiment of trying to roll off a two and a half trillion dollar MBS portfolio uh, over some period of time. And you can see here that Markets are having some challenges already with that. If you look at the, the bottom of the page, it's the spread between the yield on a current coupon and a 10-year treasury. Uh, it's basically as wide as it was in, in March of 2020. So MBS investors uncertain about how this balance sheet reduction is gonna go forward. We're at the top of the page. If you look at the primary secondary spread, sort of the competitive landscape that lenders are facing, it's getting very tight because of Again, the drop in volume that we've seen, particularly on the refi side. What's the other challenge that we're facing? Well, in the purchase market, given the very rapid run up in home prices last couple of years, and given the increase in mortgage rates, by any measure affordability is, is challenged now, particularly for first time buyers. So uh, this is a new measure we have looking at our weekly application survey, comparing the, the P&I payment on a median payment to income uh, from the BLS weekly earnings series. Then on the right, comparing that payment to uh, asking rent from the, the HVS study. So any way you look at it, rather relative to income, relative to rent, mortgage payments are up, both due to the increase in values and the increase in rates. So what, what does this all mean for lenders? So we conduct a study uh, using the Mortgage Bankers Financial Reporting Forum data. So these are lenders that sell directly into Fannie, Freddie, or securitized through Ginny. Uh, and this is a profit margin, basically, for origination business. Going back to the past dozen years or so, that margin, margin has averaged about 56 basis points. You can see during the pandemic, it got a lot wider because of capacity constraints that the industry was operating under, but 
uh, through 21 and certainly uh, by the end of last year are, are below that historical average. There are a couple of public companies that have reported earnings for Q1. Uh, we're, we're basically going to be back to sort of 2018, sort of a break-even business uh, as the industry transitions from uh, record volumes to more typical levels of volumes going forward. Uh, thought about in terms of cost to originate, as of fourth quarter, we were at an all-time high. It cost a lender $9,500 to originate a loan, and that's all in sales costs, back office costs, and any corporate costs associated with that origination. In this environment of, of declining volume and rising costs, there's going to be a lot of focus on trying to automate essentially whatever can be automated. One thing you, you saw the last couple of years, and some of this was pandemic uh, induced, some of it was uh, this cost pressure that uh, lenders were facing, is a turn to more and more use of full e-notes. So the important difference, you can have a, a paper mortgage where the borrower ink signs the note, you can scan all those documents in, and it can be a digital process from that point on. But at the end of the day, that ink signed piece of paper is the document of record. An e-note's different. With an e-note, if you have an e-signature on that uh, document, that electronic uh, file becomes the document of record. Right? That has all kinds of implications for the entire ecosystem in mortgage, including that you don't have the same type of a need for a document custodian to track the paper, right? That shipping might take a second as opposed to, you know, several days. So look at just how rapidly e-notes were taken up in 2020 and 21. Maybe we can come back to this in the Q&A. But this is a technology that's been around and in use for 20 years, <laughs> right? And all of a sudden, we got this immense take up to our 7% of volume is using e-notes. So I got a paper in Journal of Structured Finance that just came out uh, yesterday, I believe, that, um, that speaks to this. It's, it's just a really interesting economic question of what led to this tipping point where all of a sudden this is something that's, that's of interest to a lot of lenders. Then my third point, uh, just looking at servicing data, uh, I think, Larry, you're exactly right that uh, if during the crisis we had to wait for end of quarter and then a month after to get information on what was happening with forbearances, I think no policymaker in DC would have any hair left in their head. So, you know, we did a weekly study uh, and we're presenting results, you know, three days after the end of the week. And here's what we're showing here. Uh, June of 2020, eight and a half percent of all mortgages in the country were in forbearance. We have never done something like this before, right? So more, more than four and a half million at that time. Um, these forbearance plans had been on the shelf for use in natural disasters prior to the pandemic, were really formalized and simplified, I think, in 2017 for, to a very good effect, but they've never been broadly used like they were. But I think on the whole, if you look at the experience here, immensely successful policy initiative, uh, taking millions of people, sort of building a bridge over this crisis. Our last data point, we're down to 1.05% in forbearance. It's about 525,000 homeowners. Many of these actually have entered forbearance in 2022, so sort of well past sort of the worst part of the pandemic. We're tracking how they're exiting forbearance. About a third paid all the way through or reinstated. Another third got a deferral plan. Most of the remaining third got uh, modifications of one kind or another. And we're also tracking uh, how these loans are performing as they've exited. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Karen. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Karan Kaup from the uh, Urban Institute. Thank you, can you hear me okay? So I thought I'll go ahead and uh, I'll give a quick update on where, with, uh, where we are with respect to uh, regulation in the uh, IMB sector, or you know, as they're also known as non-banks. Uh, to start off, uh, I just wanted to show this table. I know you can't see the last, the title of the last uh, last column, but this basically shows sort of uh, an evolution of how non-bank financial and liquidity requirements have evolved, at least since 2015. And I'm not going to obviously go over each individual provision. You guys can read it, but just sort of at a high level. Uh, the first column shows uh, the uh, requirement that is in place today for uh, Fannie and Freddie. 
which are put forth by FHFA, and this set of requirements was finalized in 2015. Basically, you know, you got to have 6% capital. That's not risk adjusted. And then there's a flat three and a half basis points of uh, liquidity charge uh, for agency servicing. And there's an incremental NPL charge over a certain threshold. Then just before the pandemic hit us, uh, I think it was in January 2020, the FHFA put out an upgraded version of that proposal that they had been talking about for, for a long time, only to you know have to pull it back when the pandemic started. And this would have actually enhanced the previous requirements had it been finalized. Now, fast forward to February of this year, the FHFA finally reproposed uh, those set of requirements and actually incorporated a lot of lessons they learned from the pandemic to put forth uh, these set of requirements that are actually in this third column. And the big difference there from compared to what was proposed in 2020 is a departure from using a flat liquidity charge of three and a half basis points or four basis points, excuse me, to have this framework where you where a servicer has to hold liquidity that is consistent with the type of remittance cycle they're on. That is schedule, 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 actual, 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 because that's a more accurate way of measuring how much exposure an IMB has to liquidity risk. And then there is also an IM, large IMB add-on that is, if you are over 50 billion in servicing portfolio, you got to hold additional two basis points for GSC servicing and five basis points for Gini. So that's sort of the state of play on the FHA, FHFA side. With respect to Gini May, they have a requirement in place today that has been on the books for a very long time. They also proposed to upgrade those requirements last year. Again, they haven't finalized it, but Gini May took uh, a different uh, approach to its requ to requirements for its issuers compared to the, what the FHFA has done. That is, Gini has taken a more risk-based approach wherein you got, you're asked to hold capital based on the riskiness of the assets on your balance sheet, such as MSRs and loans held for sole, uh, sale and so on and so forth. And finally, the last column basically shows the requirements that were uh, promulgated by the Conference of State Banking Supervisors last year, again, culminating years and years of work on this issue. Obviously, this set of requirements is not uh, binding unless uh, the states adopt them. So where we are headed with all of this is that the FHFA has said that they expect to finalize their requirements in the next two to three months, which seems very aggressive, but if they do stick to that schedule, it, we could expect a new set of requirements sometime by late summer, early fall, and then they also expect those requirements to actually go into effect at the end of the year. Gini's timing is less certain because they haven't, uh, their requirements have been outstanding for a long time, and they haven't said anything publicly lately about the timing, so we'll see. Uh, how that works out. There are a couple of really important considerations I think that need to be uh, mentioned as FHFA and Gini uh, work through these proposals. One, I think uh, there is a need for some fundamental alignment around uh, some of the core pillars of how they are tackling it. As I just mentioned, the FHFA is taking an approach where they're asking uh, servicers to hold uh, liquidity that is consistent with the type of servicing and type of advancing obligation that they have, whereas Gini's is more uh, similar to, uh, you know, it's, it's, more, it's, more, it's a more bank-like uh, capital framework where you've got to have, there's a certain risk weight on MSR, there's a certain risk weight on loans held for sale, there is uh, different treatment for excess MSR. So I think there is a lot of room for FHFA and Gini to try and harmonize things amongst themselves as much as possible to avoid creating too much fragmentation. And then there are also some provisions in the proposals that I think are, you know, quite punitive actually. Uh, so for instance, there is the unused uh, portions of committed lines of credit. There's a charge on TBA hedging that I think is going to be counterproductive. Um, so all of that, I think, raises a fun fundamental question that if you are going to have a regulatory regime where, uh, you know, Fannie, Freddie, and Ginny are going to put forth their requirements to suit their own, you have to understand Fannie and Freddie and, and Ginny May are going to put forth these requirements from the point of view of managing their own counterparty risk as opposed to trying to potentially regulate these entities. So the question is, 
given the IMB sector, given how big it is today, 90% of FHA originations, 70% of all agency originations, it raises a question in the long run as to whether uh, you know, we need to, in the future, move to a place where they are prudentially regulated by a single regulator at the federal level. Um, and so, if you know, the ideal state, you know, that you know, we've done some thinking around, uh, and this may be too idealistic, is to have a situation. At the same time, we're trying to solve for the liquidity risks uh, through these regulations. So, one possibility in the long run is to have IMBs that are prudentially regulated at the federal level through a single regulator. And that gives some comfort to the federal home loan banks to uh, allow IMBs into the home loan bank system, just as banks are in that system. And that way you, uh, you, you know, streamline the regulatory framework for the IMBs. You solve the liquidity issues that we're always worried about in the IMB sector, because there's nothing better than access to a home loan bank advancing facility uh, than, you know, uh, these additional liquidity requirements. And I think the final thing here on the, the chart on the right shows the home loan bank advances outstanding, which is the gray line at the bottom. And you see today they have around 350 or $400 billion worth of advances outstanding, which is a lot less than what they used to have 20 years ago when the number was, I think, in the six or $700 billion. So there's a question of how well can the home loan banks continue to meet their housing mission uh, while not allowing IMBs into their membership circle because they are the mortgage market today. And finally, I'll just quickly skim through these couple of slides. Uh, this shows the upward, steep upward drift in FICO scores over the last 20 years. You know, enhanced increased cost of doing business for the industry, uh, you know, is eventually going to get passed on to consumers, either in the form of reduced access or higher prices. And here you see the 10th percentile FICO score is the yellow line has actually gone up by something like 80 points over the last 20 years, which is a huge, huge increase. So again, huge implications for equity and you know reducing the racial home ownership gap. And finally, this is uh, another on our, our housing product availability index that pretty much shows the same thing over time. That is, we've just made it so incredibly difficult to get a mortgage that. We, you know, we almost normalized the system that we have today. But if you really take a long-term look, a 20-year look back at where we used to be, uh, uh, it does, uh, you know, give you a pause and makes you think about how tight credit standards, uh, you know, uh, are in place today relative to what you had even way before the uh, uh, the Great Recession. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate being invited here, as I said, in these tumultuous times. It is so important to have researchers coming together and looking at the data. And it's so remarkable how much data we now have, as Larry Cordell said, so quickly. And how quickly policymakers can respond. So two years after COVID, I think we can look back. And the consensus is, next slide, that the major policy in mortgage markets of forbearance Oh dear, there we go, here we go, good. The major policy of forbearance in mortgage markets was a success, as Mike Fratitone just said, even an amazing success. Although I think there's less consensus as to why the success, and I will address that in my brief comments today. So this is data, which is um, in part, I'm not sure of this data, but I've had related data that comes from Larry Cordell, and I thank Larry Cordell very much for it because I was able to um, use it in response to <clears throat> in a conference at Brookings where the question of this particular why is forbearance and mortgage a success, again agreeing it is a success. So what do we see here? The white line is the mortgage line and this is showing defaults during COVID and forbearances are not counted as delinquency. So delinquency rapidly dropped off for mortgages. Uh, uh, HELOCs are the blue, mortgages are the white. So rapidly forbearances because they were automatic. People were self-selected, not only in the federally backed mortgage lenders, but across the board as the simple self-selection policy protocol was adopted by non-banks as well. Not so much 
for the drop off also occurred on student debt, where again, it was automatic. And in fact, you didn't even have to apply for it for student debt, but automatically were granted for bear. And so you see that sharp decline in student debt delinquency, but not so much for the others, for auto, for credit card, uh, didn't increase, but did not decline either. These were negotiated. You needed to negotiate with your provider of your loans. And so the relief was not immediate. Next slide. Even better, uh, this you've seen this actually just previously in, in uh, Mike's data, um, not quite as current, but you see here the decline. Now this is including forbearance for born loans as delinquent. So they're delinquent and they go up, and but they come down again. So this is where the major success is for mortgages. Because a forbearance is, is nothing more than postponement of debt due. And for student debt, still due. But for mortgages, this forborn loan has pretty much been paid back. And we're back where we were pre-COVID. Why is that? Well, in part, of course, it is because of the aggressive fiscal and monetary support to the overall economy. But despite that, of course, we still have a tremendous amount of student debt and their pockets of the economy that are still problematic, but not so much the housing market and the mortgage market. Of course, the other answer is that housing prices, of course, due to the demand supply imbalances, have done so extraordinarily uh, in such extraordinary run up. But there's another reason as well. Next slide, please. And you've seen this slide too. This is a slide that uh, we just saw uh, for Urban Institute. And I thank Urban Institute for providing it to me as well. And you can see here that after the great financial crisis, mortgage lending quality standards have been maintained. And I understand that Ed is going to provide some information. The AEA, uh, AEI also tracks this, and they too see that mortgage quality standards were maintained even during the crisis, even though unemployment increased to 15% for a few months. And even though there's tremendous pressure now with prices being so high and housing being so unaffordable, mortgage lending standards have been maintained. That's not a small thing after the run up in the great financial crisis where we saw mortgage lending standards crater. Next slide, please. And we see that this is appreciated by markets as well. This is credit transfer pricing, uh, which is one of the reforms that have been put into place since the great financial crisis. And with the latest uh, innovations at, uh, through FHFA, it has come back, credit risk transfers, which I think is an extremely good thing because it does give us real-time data on how markets are perceiving risk. And you can see in the first slide here, as well as in the second, the first slide is uh, we produced it, my co-authors, Pedro Guete and Athena Suderos and myself, uh, we tracked uh, secondary sales of, and pricing of credit risk transfers. And you can see how dramatically on the left during the crisis months uh, we had, before forbearance came through, we had a dramatic spike in the risk where it really was a concern that mortgages would go into default delinquency as unemployment rose. So the question of the missing mortgages was it due to illiquidity? Was it due to insolvency? I think the answer, and at this point, there was a real risk, and a real risk that maybe it would be more than illiquidity, maybe it would be insolvency. The answer is very clear at this point that the problem that forbearance, I believe, that the problem that forbearance solved was an illiquidity problem because credit standards had been in fact, maintained. So people were, in fact, able to pay back their mortgages once, of course, uh, the economy recovered. So we see that the pricing of risk has now uh, returned, uh, not as low as it was, but uh, in, within bounds near. And we see on the left uh, data that is now regularly collected, much to my pleasure, by Andy Davidson's firm, and uh, Fred uh, pr provides it, which shows uh, uh, credit risk transfer pricing versus triple B, and it's pretty much 
in line, which is what you would think. So next slide. So uh, again, um, underlying the point of how well standards have been maintained. This is, I think, a dramatic picture of this, which shows the um, uh, credit score percentage, the high percentage score percentage, especially most recently in mortgages. This is an incredibly solid book of business, although, of course, it also reflects uh, that uh, it is getting less affordable to get a mortgage. Next slide. So what did we learn? We learned in an illiquidity crisis, forbearance works as it does in natural disasters. We also learned, I believe, the importance of solvency and keeping mortgage debt within bounds through mortgage standards. What a disaster it would have been if we had been hit with COVID at the same time as a great financial crisis. But we learned from the great financial crisis. Now we're into another world. What's next? Well, clearly what's next is after this run up in mortgage rates in a spectacular, unprecedented in several months of 200 basis points plus, they're likely to go higher. And we're now, as of uh, two days ago, at 5.5% 30-year fixed rate mortgage, as we see here. So what does that pretend going forward? Next slide, please. So I cheated. We've got lots of data on this slide. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. So here is where we are on inventories. The top most left inventories, of course, are dramatically low. And what you will hear, and this is the importance of fast data, is that inventories have increased ever so slightly. So that pretends perhaps a slowing of this double digit price rises, but it's still very low historical inventories. And here you can't see that because it doesn't have the last few days of inventories, but we're still at very, very low levels. So what do we, this is all, this is Zillow data, by the way, Zillow data, we've taken this from Zillow data, we put it together. So on the um, right hand side, top of the slide, we're looking at the ratio of prices to rents. And the bottom over here, we're looking at the ratio of prices to rents in 2022 versus 2021. For the top 100, every dot is one of their top 100 MSAs. And you can see that the price to rent ratio in 2022 is higher than the price to rent ratio in 2021, every one of the 100 metro areas, largest metro areas, despite the fact that rents are up too significantly. So the question of what does this pretend? Uh, it, for my mind, pretends a deep affordability problem, which I'm going to mention in a moment to the right, the other uh, perhaps puzzling uh, do, uh, dots. Um, but before that, I don't believe it pretends a, it's not a bubble in a macro sense. And why is that? Because the financial system is not at risk. And why is that? Not to be repetitive, but to be repetitive because lending standards have been maintained. But the deep affordability problem, of course, we've got a lot of focus on the problem of supply shortages and how that's causing construction costs, housing prices to go up. But it's not just that, it's land and it's regulation. So in a paper that I'm doing with my co-author, Jessen Lin, we show using the Wharton Real Estate Regulatory Index, we show the relationship of price to rent, again, in the 100 major areas, uh, major mess, 100 largest MSAs, the price to rent ratio relative to the Worley Index of Restrictiveness. Again, R square, very simple. We do other stuff, obviously. We've got a working paper. But in a very simple back of the envelope, we've got an R square of 94% and a slope of one in terms of the impact of the index on the price to rent ratio. Next slide. So it's not the way it was. We lost a trillion dollars in mortgages in a few years after the recession. 
Hopefully we won't have a recession, but if we do, we're not likely to see that kind of freeze up of the system, thankfully. Next slide. So we do have work ahead, however, because this maintenance of these mortgage standards is de facto. It's not de jour. The system we're operating under is a de facto system. If I may remind folks, Fannie and Freddie are owned by the government and they're supposed to be temporary. Perhaps we can return to that in discussion. Thank you. Then, uh, so first of all, thank you for the opportunity to participate. Second of all, Larry, thank you for the shout out and kind words about uh, our uh, low latency data. I'll use that term. Um, the first observation I'd make of, of a number of observations, what I think we learned, uh, relates uh, uh, to um, Karen's remarks about uh, independent mortgage bankers. Uh, we have to be wary of what uh, industry requests for industry bailouts. There was a huge amount of pressure when Congress was considering um, the uh, original act back in March, February, March of 2020 to include a liquidity provision just for uh, mortgage bankers. Uh, that continued after uh, the CARES Act was passed uh, during the month of April and May, and Treasury and FHFA, Ginny, uh, HUD all pushed back against that, and there never was a specific liquidity uh, uh, instrument set up for that. And in fact, um, the mortgage bankers was re were required to uh, meet their uh, contractual obligations to make those advances. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this next uh, slide takes what we learned from having looked at 220 million loans that were originated from 1993 to 2019 at a loan level. We did this work uh, jointly with uh, FHFA and we extracted the loans from 2006 and seven, which are the uh, core period at the, at the peak of the, uh, the housing bubble. And those are the two vintages that had the highest default rates. And that gives us, and, and there's an example in the um, appendix, there's also in the appendix, uh, a chart that shows that um, the uh, mortgage risk index today is uh, similar to what it was in 1992. Uh, and much lower than it was in the uh, late 90s and the aught years. Uh, but what this shows is if we take the uh, uh, stress mortgage default rates from the 06, 07 books of business, and those are based only on loan characteristics known at point of origination. They're the usual things, uh, credit score, loan to value, uh, debt to income ratio, loan type, loan uh, uh, tenure, loan term, et cetera. We take all that information and we figure out the correlations to uh, not using a model, but just based on the raw data, um, what uh, the default rates are, and they actually form into what we call a periodic table. Um, we then take loans as they're originated every month uh, and we look at how, uh, at origination, based on those characteristics, we give them a score. Uh, here, what we did, and I'll just focus on the gray and the orange, the gray um, is the average MDR of the loans that were originated uh, in 2016 to 2019. And the orange, uh, note that one uses the left scale and the other uses the right scale, um, but the, uh, the, the slope of that uh, uh, orange line is identical to the slope of uh, the gray line and has an R squared of 99.9%. So the loans that we predicted would be um, risky at origination in terms of under stress turned out to be the loans that went into default. And again, we're using the definition of default. Uh, it, ex it includes anything that went into forbearance. Uh, I'll come back to this in a moment. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, we also uh, learned that spending matters. Um, spending fueled by stimulus has fueled aggregate demand and inflation. We're all aware of what's going on. Uh, we have another data source that we use that we get uh, weekly, and this is uh, as of um, last, uh, last uh, has about a three week latency. So it's about four weeks old. And uh, first, the first the slide that's here shows what happened over time. And we see that uh, for the lowest income quintiles on, the, on my uh, left, you see that spending marched up on an inflation adjusted basis year by year by year. You can't even see the effect of the pandemic other than that spending kept going up. 
uh, when you look at the fifth uh, quintile, the highest income quintile, you see that spending went up from 2019 to 20, uh, but then, uh, excuse me, 2018 to 19, but then dropped in 2020 as those households were not getting stimulus, um, but they were getting a uh, lower stock market. There was questions about house prices, et cetera. And then it comes back, roaring back, uh, very strongly in 2021. We know because we track 2022 that, that inflation adjusted uh, spending continues to go up very rapidly um, for all income uh, uh, areas. It's currently going up at, um, uh, I think, uh, the um, uh, 17 percent, excuse me, 12 percent for the lowest quintile and 17 and 19 percent for the two highest. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, the fourth um, uh, thing that we learned was that work from home uh, has increased outflow from large markets to smaller markets, and that this trend started indeed way before uh, the pandemic. Uh, the media was reporting things that weren't actually happening. Uh, this slide was provided courtesy of, of Sam Cater at, F at uh, Freddie Mac, uh, but we see it accelerated tremendously with the onset of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Uh, this next slide uh, builds on uh, some of the stuff Susan went over with housing inventory at uh, historic low. Uh, a seller's market, uh, if you ease credit, it will get immediately capitalized into higher prices. Uh, credit easing can be loan level credit easing, leverage, or it can be leasing by the Fed, uh, ZERP and uh, quantitative easing. And we see a very strong correlation. Uh, the the uh, HPA line is inverted to show that correlation. Um, and so in order to get back to a period where we have much lower house price appreciation, our current estimates are they're still running in the mid-teens using Optimal Blue data, which takes us through June. Uh, we'd have to get uh, month's inventory up from something over one little around 1% to something closer to 5%. That is a heavy lift in the next uh, uh, 12 months or more. Next slide, please. The work from home um, revolution uh, and ZERP and quantitative easing have really uh, hit the low income borrowers the, the worst, which is what generally always happens. And uh, so we see here, this is our attempt to see the shift in the marketplace. And so we see that the types of loans uh, and the change in HPA, the X axis, and is the change in HPA, the change in median change in income at the track level uh, is on the Y axis. And you see a very strong uh, trend line as you move from low uh, HPA at the track level, also has low income changes. Uh, but as the HPA increases, the income necessarily increases, which then uh, we then tie to FHA share. And you see that FHA share tends to be very high at the places that have high uh, house price appreciation. And of course, they get squeezed out of the process. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide covers uh, uh, the powerful forces that can continue for a long time. Uh, so purchase activity is powering through these headwinds. Again, we use Optimal Blue data, uh, which is from last week, and we now have a 5.5% interest rate. And we see that purchase volume is down only 6% over 2001 and is up 18% over 2019, which was a very strong year. Um, and so we see that um, uh, HPA remains robust, as I mentioned, and we have an unhealthy market that's gonna take quite a while to recover from. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our solutions are two uh, that I can mention. Uh, first is uh, Lift Home, low income first time uh, home buyer, uh, and that is to build wealth and reduce stress mortgage default rates for first time, first generation low income home buyers. Uh, this has been proposed by a number of, of uh, legislators in both the House and the Senate. It hasn't uh, gotten uh, passed, of course, but um, we have hopes for uh, perhaps next year. Uh, but this is one way to actually uh, narrow the wealth gap uh, effectively. Last slide, please. Solution number two. Uh, it's already been touched on by Susan, add supply, but we go beyond that to say any supply, all fire in the direction of the enemy is appropriate, so any supply is good, but the best supply to add is at the middle of the price range using what we call light touch density and walkable learning development. And there's a thought experiment we have here about the car market, um, and then we show kind of how uh, filtering works, and, ha and, and there's academic research that supports um, these, these numbers. Um, and the... I would only add that we're getting traction on light touch density. 
Uh, in particular, California has passed two laws, uh, Senate Bill 9 and Senate Bill 10. Senate Bill 10 is actually named by the sponsor as the Light Touch Density Act, which is a term that we uh, coined back in 2019. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to the panelists. Um, I, I'd just like to, if the panelists have questions for each other, I'd like to give you a few minutes to ask them. And in the meantime, uh, uh, those of you who are participating virtually, again, please feel free to place your questions in the chat, and you can also raise your hand to be unmuted. Okay, okay. You guys jump in? Yeah. Um, so just a, a couple of reactions. Um, so I think with respect to regulation of independent mortgage banks or, or non-banks, uh, agree with a lot of what, what Karan was, was saying. I think in terms of the framework, it's important to recognize that what the Dodd-Frank Act did was something that was really important with the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Any consumer-facing regulation is the same regardless of the charter of the lender, right? And that was a huge advance from what was true in the, before the great financial crisis where the rules that the borrower is operating under changed depending upon whether that was a state-regulated, federally-regulated, bank, non-bank. That, that that's not the case anymore for consumer-facing regulations. I think that, that was a really important advance. Um, on the other hand, Safety and soundness regulation should differ by charter because there are different business models taking different types of risks. So I think that that makes sense. Uh, you know, if, if you ask a independent mortgage bank who operates nationally, uh, are they regulated? They would say we have 54 regulators. You have the 50 states plus DC plus Fannie, Freddie, and Ginny uh, regulating them in addition to, to their warehouse lenders. Um, I would agree with Susan's point that the credit conditions in this market uh, have stayed very, very disciplined, and again, would point to the Dodd-Frank Act and the QMATR rule as uh, really hemming in what can be done. Uh, you know, I think Ed's, Ed's pointed out that there certainly has been uh, greater use to higher LTV and some lower credit score, but th those are really the only dimensions that are moving. The more uh, egregious uh, uh, underwriting that and documentation that was not done pre grand financial crisis, uh, those more conservative traditional approaches have been locked in. And then just the last point, I totally agree that the lack of inventory uh, really is the biggest problem in the market right now. We all pointed to different affordability measures. Uh, if you talk to builders, they're facing so many different supply chain constraints, different uh, item in shortage each week, um, maybe getting a little bit better as we get through this year. But sort of the good news is that we got about 800,000 single family homes under construction, another 800,000 multifamily units under construction. And that means we're finally meeting the pace of household formation, which hasn't happened in over a decade. So um, potentially getting better from here. So a few, uh, few observations. First of all, I was actually I had thought my last read on how much it cost to originate a mortgage was something in the tune of $8,000. <laughs> so I'm, it's now, we're now at almost close to $10,000, yeah. which is just, just a ridiculous number in my view. So just throw that out there. Um, uh, you know, uh, Susan mentioned credit standards have been maintained, which is absolutely true. Uh, but I just wanted to um, put one once in there, which is that yes, they are have by and large been maintained, including throughout the pandemic, but there was this period in Q2 2020 when you did see a substantial uh, contraction of credit, yeah. not just in the non-agency space, which was absolutely frozen, but also in the agency space, there was a skyrocketing increase in FICOs um, as lenders did everything they could to conserve capital and de-risk their balance sheet. So uh, there was a period when credit standards did tighten substantially, and that mm -hmm. just reflects the market. Uh, on the uh, agree with Ed's point that we did not eventually need the IMB liquidity facility. However, again, the nuance there is that you also had a situation where Fannie and Freddie and Ginny made, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of accommodations mm -hmm. for their servicers to be able to, to, to reduce the stress on them. For instance, Ginny may put out their PTAP program 
uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they accelerated reimbursements for the servicers that helped out a lot. They also made certain relaxations on their PNI advancing terms and conditions for the servicers. And most importantly, you have a, you know, you had a refinance wave of gigantic proportions, which uh, ended up giving the sector a lot of, um, you know, <clears throat> float income that they could use from this month to make the PNI payment on delinquent loans. Uh, that had refinanced previously. So there were a lot of things that happened that tailwinds that actually worked to, you know, largely minimize the stress on the industry in that period. Uh, <clears throat> and final thing on the uh, credit availability indices, and I, you know, this applies to ETS index, this applies to R index. One of the things these indices, uh, you know, setting aside the methodological differences or what they show, one of the things these indices don't take into account and which is very hard to take into account is the fact that um, they simply don't account for the fact that we uh, as an industry, the GSEs, the GMA, and FHA, everyone has access to such good data today on loans that were made after the crisis. And that if we're still looking at FICO scores from previous, uh, you know, pre, uh, from the pre-bubble era DTIs and loan to values and saying, well, this is the expected probability of default in the, on this loan. But the GSEs today have access to dozens and dozens of data points at the point of origination that they just did not have prior to 2008. They have their models are much more sophisticated. They're just able to do a lot better job in terms of assessing the uh, credit risk of the loans that they are buying. So again, these indices largely do not uh, account for that. Um, and I think just one more point on the lift mortgage. I wholeheartedly support that mortgage. My only, this is rather of more of a question than a critique is, as we know, the 30 year fixed rate mortgage benefits from an extremely liquid program where the bid ask spreads are really, really tiny. 20 year may be a good solution in the long run, but um, <clears throat> I'm yet to be convinced that um, that the liquidity in that market is uh, low, uh, is high enough to offset uh, the liquidity premium that you would have to pay in order to, for the cost, for, for the consumer to benefit from the shorter uh, term. So we'll just have to see how that works. Okay. Um, on the liquidity question, uh, again, I guess my point would be that there was a push to uh, come up with a liquidity uh, facility that was just for uh, the mortgage bankers. And if that had been done, then you wouldn't have had some of the things that, that were just mentioned um, that were done by the, the GSEs and Ginny May and things like that without having the easy money of the treasury just opening a spigot, which is what, in my opinion, was, was kind of being asked for, uh, was a, a facility. And I was involved in a lot of discussions with uh, FHFA and Ginny and and, and 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 FHA at the time about what they could craft, but that was all because they didn't have to do it from the point of view of having that liquidity facility already approved by Congress. Um, and secondly, um, in terms of traditional data, I think my point would be we don't know how some of the new, and I'm all in favor of new data. Uh, we back test and back test and back test new data, which is what we did with Optimal Blue. We went through a tremendous amount of back testing on that uh, to make sure it actually would predict what we thought it was going to predict just for those three months that we were picking up, uh, much less that it was actually the trend. Uh, and we were able to confirm that and continue to confirm that. Um, and so my point on that one slide that I showed uh, the history is that you take just the traditional things. People say, oh, DTI doesn't make that much difference. Oh, FICO isn't good enough whatever. We use those traditional items and we got a 99.9% .9 correlation in terms of that slope of the curve. Um, you know, the height of the curve, we didn't, we, that was truncated because you had forbearance. Uh, but we were basically, if you just count all those delinquencies and you plot the, the shape of the curve, you get the same curve. So um, that tells me that the, this traditional data are actually telling us something and they're working. And we know from history that they work. Um, next is FHA um, is really the, the weak spot in, in all of this because their mortgage default rate uh, numbers are still uh, up approaching 30%. And that's not too different than where they were back in uh, the aught years. Uh, but their share in the aught years was about 2% uh, in the later aught years, the 06, 07. Uh, and today it's more like 15%, uh, 12 to 15. And so that's a concern. Uh, which is why we propose things like like lift home. And regarding lift home, 
you know, excellent point about uh, liquidity, our challenge that we're making to, and we've done this for years and we're reiterating it to Fannie and Freddie, they are, this is supposed to be what they're experts at. Um, they figure out how to you know, package everything, including the squeal from the pig uh, and, and, and put that together. Uh, and so we're challenging them to turn their, the best and brightest minds to figure this out because there are some advantages to the 20 year loan. It's going to have a, a, a shorter duration in, over uh, all things being equal. It's, it should have some uh, lower prepayment experience. It should have lower default rate. Uh, there are certain things that should be there should be having a more predictable um, uh, uh, prepayment rate. And all of those things reduce uh, volatility. So we would challenge the agencies to uh, put their heads together and figure out how to do that. Yeah. I don't know if you want to say uh, let me just quickly say uh, a comment on a comment by Karan, which points to the importance of, of lending standards, not just keeping them from deteriorating, but keeping them from ratcheting up as you go into a crisis, which is exactly what was happening before the forbearance illiquidity collective action solution was put into place. So I didn't want to minimize the forbearance policy as a solution to a liquidity problem. It was real. Uh, we have a, a few questions from the chat. Let me take a question from the chat and then I'll take the uh, audience questions. Um, so uh, one question here is, uh, and I'll slightly rephrase it. Uh, uh, did the surge in uh, refinancing perhaps aggravate the decline in inventory? Uh, if a household refinanced the lock in a low rate, would that not increase the likelihood that the borrower would be unwilling to sell in the near future uh, as rates rise, which they have? In, in short, yes. And going forward, this lock-in is going to be a, a problem. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think, and I always hesitate to say this time is different, um, because in finance, it generally isn't. But there are some very different fundamentals about this market. Uh, Susan mentioned, you know, rents are doing uh, the supply issue that we've we've been mentioning. We have a long way to go just to get um, up to uh, five, six months. You can't have house price declines if you have an inventory of um, less than seven months. Uh, you look at that chart. You have to be above seven months in order to actually have real price declines. Um, and uh, we also have the work from home and all of these things. We have the shortage, uh, just general, the, the demographics that are going on uh, and the lock in um, that continues. Uh, it's now you can refinance. You can uh, take out a home equity loan if you want to remodel your house rather than moving. You have all kinds of options uh, and it's all buttressed by um, credit uh, that's actually pretty much under control, particularly everywhere but FHA, and that only matters in, in a systemic way if they're concentrated in particular neighborhoods. Leonard? Um, yeah, I'll just add on to that. I don't know anything about this, but the $8 trillion got originated at about 3%, and now we're at 5 dollars That's it. The flip side of the lock-in is a capital loss. Where does that show up? In the several hundred billion dollars. Right? Well, the Fed's got what a trillion and a half of that. Two and a half. Two and a half trillion. Um, and so I just was reading something this morning that says, and I, I've been counseling, you know in our writings, that the Fed should immediately stop QE, that should immediately go to uh, quantitative tightening immediately and not pussyfoot around as it's been doing and signaling and all this stuff. It needs to um, stop this crazy house price appreciation that it's been promoting. It, it, they're, they're responsible for a chunk of it, not all of it, but a good chunk of it. But they have two and a half trillion dollars of that. Um, and of that eight trillion, um, whatever's left isn't a trillion because a lot of that got refinanced the second time and whatever, uh, or purchases that got refinanced. So I don't know what the amount that's left is, but it might be, I'm be charitable say it's five and a half trillion. So the Fed's got a big chunk of that. Um, and they have a big loss if they were to sell it. But on the other hand, um, they have to look at this as how do we actually stop punishing low income buyers? Because yep. that's the way I would phrase it. Yeah. So the I losses, that, I assume you are yourself absorbing the losses perhaps in a retirement account. Uh, the stock market is, uh, I don't know what's happening at this moment, but it's cratering and so is the bond market. 
There you go. There's a lot of wealth loss happening. That, the other place you see it is in uh, bank portfolios, the available for sale portion that has securities. They were marked down. So a lot of particularly large banks, you saw that in their earnings reports in the first quarter, a big markdown. But I just confirmed, and this doesn't count the bond uh, uh, losses, but the, between the stock market since the beginning of 2020 uh, and home prices since the beginning of 2020, the net increase of those two groups is $18 trillion. That's after the stock market decline through roughly yesterday, and it includes uh, house price appreciation through roughly um, April, $18 trillion. That's why we have this massive wealth effect. And that's why home, that's why home ownership rates are actually going up yeah. because people have savings. Yeah. Um, yes. Thanks very much for a lot of great information. Uh, it's often said that necessity is the mother of invention. So if you think about the COVID-19 crisis and you think about the result, for example, forbearance, uh, I know that later on in this conference there will, there will be information presented on climate change and how it affects the mortgage market. Do you see any sort of precedence for forbearance on a regional application because of climate change? Well, let me just quickly say forbearance is done regularly, all the time. Yeah. In fact, that was the model that was adopted in the COVID-19 forbearance. And so, and it's very important. It works. So actually, I, don't, uh, I haven't read the papers, that are, but I will be very attentive to the papers being presented tomorrow. Uh, a misunderstanding that uh, being in the path of a storm, in fact, means that uh, the market is harmed, but because of insurance and forbearance, in fact, those markets tend to do pretty well. Not to say that that's a long run solution. That's a whole other situation. And I do not think insolvency, again, you can, you can solve for insolvency through forbearance. So if you're going to have uh, sunny day flooding, which we will, unfortunately, in the decades to come, forbearance will not be a solution. I'll just add one thing to that uh, again. Uh, Forbearance is done regularly in disaster situations by Fannie and Freddie. It happens all the time. I mean, one of the fascinating things about the COVID-19 forbearance experiment is that it just raises the question uh, as to whether uh, it is time for researchers to think about, um, you know, a future mortgage contract or something like this or a version of this. Again, not not an 18 month forbearance, but something like it ought to be institutionalized in some fashion because homeowners are always going to hit speed bumps along the way as they go along their business. There is going to be a recession at some point. People are going to lose their jobs. And especially for uh, folks with limited wealth and lower incomes, we work so hard to put them in their homes. Again, $9,500 to originate a mortgage. And the last thing you want to do is to <clears throat> Uh, not give them every single opportunity uh, to help them stay in that home. So I, you know, again, we're a bunch of researchers here. So definitely encourage everyone to th think if there are ways to somehow institutionalize some version, some limited version of forbearance moving forward as a way to help people retain the homes they bought. So I'd rather we use that intellectual brain power to figure out how to institutionalize the 20-year mortgage for that these too. borrowers, because that's really, I think, the the long-term solution that actually solves the problem and builds, builds wealth and deals with the uh, equity uh, gap. But I would use the student loan program as an example of excessive market interference as a history of leading to an absurd result. And so what's different about student loan as bad, in my opinion, as, as, as nationalized as the housing market is in the United States, the student loan market has the same parties on both the origination side. In effect, the government sets the, the standards, they're very loose um, for the, the uh, universities and colleges, and the Treasury makes the loans. So it was very easy for Congress just to say, stop paying everybody. They, they couldn't do that as easily in the mortgage market, thankfully, but they could do it in student loan. And where are we today? It's coming up on two years and four months in June, and it'll probably get extended again, who knows? And now they're talking about 10,000, who knows how much in just wishing it away and saying it's it's gone. Well, that that is not the way to run a railroad. I mean, you can't run a financial system of a market-based economy doing that. And so I would just 
use that as a cautionary tale. Let me just throw my vote in with Quran to uh, apply your intellectual uh, energies towards sustainable uh, product development. I, the 20 year mortgage, in case you get a misimpression, has been around forever. Every lender has it on their product sheet. It's originated, it's securitized, but it's more expensive. And we were, a lot of us have been talking about how if you look by any measure of affordability, payment to income, payment to rent, for a 30-year mortgage, that looks pretty expensive right now. For a 20-year, even more. And that's even beyond the point that Karan made about how the securitization of those loans results in a much less efficient methodology. So uh, the only way for, for Ed's plan that this would work is if you subsidize it, and uh, there's not a lot of money to do that in, in today's, uh, today's budget, I don't think. We're going to... Um the last question. Um, yes, uh, Ralu. Hi. Um, very, very interesting discussion. Um, I wonder if um, reflecting now on what went well and what went not so well with COVID-19 support in the mortgage market, um, could we um, look back and see um, not only what uh, was right, but also what was not right. We know, according to NBER, that unemployment rate was very high, uh, up to uh, maximum quarter two. But then um, there was no more really an economic depression. So could it be that maybe um, the measures that were taken uh, were um, lingering for too long, too much support maybe? Um, and maybe there is no right or wrong answer here, but could it be that uh, maybe um, there was excessive support when it was not really needed because the economy really recovered? Thank you. That's a very important question, but I want to answer the question that you sort of were starting with, which is what went right, what went wrong, have we covered it? And it's briefly said, but refinancing was such an important part. So refinancing when uh, you can when interest rates go down, which is often during a recession, particularly for minorities. But the transfer of wealth was about $100 million, which was huge. So it is a pro-equity uh, uh, move as well. The larger question, the other question that you go to is, did we move quickly enough? And, you know, Monday morning quarterback, absolutely, we did not move quickly enough, right? But that's after after the fact. And this, I think the question you raise is going to be debated for quite a long time. Um, I want to thank our panelists and thank the audience and the virtual participants as well uh, for their questions.